Thank you for your presentation. Let's begin with our question and answer session. In the context of our discussion today, how can mindfulness benefit the individual? Well, humans natu naturally rely on established associations and cognitive shortcuts to navigate through the world. Some shortcuts are necessary. For example, knowing your bias toward what you prefer to eat for breakfast. However, these associations can be destructive when it comes to certain biases especially related to age and race. In the criminal law context, for instance, it's crucial that everyone involved in the system, from politicians to private executives, be mindful of their biases. In a 2015 Central Michigan University study by Professor Adam Lewick, Mindfulness meditation, in fact, caused an increase in state mindfulness and a decrease in implicit race and age bias. And so, what role does reflection play in leadership? Life is a long series of experiences, decisions, successes, and lessons learned. One of the keys to ultimate success, global competitive, competitiveness, the appreciation of diversity and tackling global challenges is the ability to make sense of, appreciate, and grow from those experiences. My advice would be to take time to reflect and determine what worked for you, where you had challenges or made mistakes, and where you experienced failures over the past year. So, does mindfulness play a role in sustainability? Actually, according to Erickson, Coinstad, and Barstad, subjective well-being sought through other means than material consumption, which put ecosystems under immense pressure, such as through the practice of mindfulness, could make an important contribution to sustainability. Research shows that mindfulness contributes to subjective well-being by focusing the mind on the here and now, allowing stronger empathy and compassion, facilitating clarification of goals and values, and enabling people to avoid the perpetual accumulation of material wealth mistaken for happiness, while simultaneously reducing pressure on natural ecosystems. Can collective consciousness be toxic, such as in collectively and uniformly agreeing upon something potentially harmful or discriminatory? Well, what you're describing is not, in fact, collective consciousness. Collective consciousness is a set of shared beliefs, shared values, ideas, and knowledge that form the adhesive which holds a society together and empowers them to collectively tackle issues which jeopardize the well-being of the society. How should leaders implement mindfulness? Mindfulness tools include meditation, breathing, yoga, walking, music, nature, and anything that allows you to, be, to come back to the present moment. Our minds are often thinking about regrets, incidents from the past, and worries about the future. Any tool that brings the mind back to the present moment is a mindfulness tool. Exercise and focused breathing, posture, and bodily reflection can help strengthen a leader's mindfulness and emotional intelligence. Just like that of any other individual. How can we eliminate the ego in battling xenophobia? Anxiety and fear become unified in, a, in, in any phobic experience, including xenophobia, and the fear of those who are unlike us. Our ego places a subjective danger onto an external object 
such as those immigrating from other countries. Exercising mindfulness and reflection can help us identify these mental processes and their consequent emergent manifested behaviors, ultimately with the goal of incorporating a diversity of thought and experience toward the co-generation of knowledge, solutions, and productive collective consciousness. So how does a lack of consciousness relate to religious fanaticism? Well, according to famous evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins, like genes and gene complexes, when an ideology is replicated or passed from one person or group to another, it undergoes mutations. As a consequence, different versions of that belief system are produced which generate different types of behavior. It then follows that at times there can consequently be harmful variants of Christianity, Islam, or almost any other religion which cause the host mind to process information in a biased way, think irrationally, and become delusional. Being able to identify the mutation of ideology as it spreads through the practice of mindfulness and reflection can help prevent the mutation or even the spread of infectious and harmful thoughts and behaviors from person to person. Could you distinguish a bit more the differences in the leadership style we see in organizations around the world today versus what you call mindful leadership? Well, my experience in the leadership that's happening around the world today is that it's extremely hierarchical and bureaucratic. It is top-down and it generally reflects, uh, the decisions of leaders reflect what their thinking is. It is not an inclusive approach, it is exclusive. A mindfulness approach would, would be more inclusive. It would stop to reflect upon what's happening within the individual who's making the decision. It would stop to reflect upon how that decision truly affects those around them, but it would include the people around them. And in mindfulness, it's grounded on an awareness and our presence within a community. Okay. Could you elaborate a bit further on your concept of sustainability and what the role of mindfulness is in achieving that? Well, mindfulness in sustainability, um, let's put it this way, sustainable, a sustainable approach to the world and to an organization, if approached with a mindfulness um, perspective, really sees the organization as a whole and sees how it affects the rest of the world because mindfulness is an inclusive, an inclusionary dynamic. Generally speaking, organizations look to the short term. How can we uh, attain profit within this quarter? A sustainable organization looks to the long term and it looks, like, it looks at how this organization not only affects the people that's within it, but affects the environment. Do we um, enhance and bring life to the people around us? Do we develop their cultural nourishment? And do we, how do we affect and nourish the environment that's around us? Not only our business environment, but our, our, uh, and our social environment, but the physical environment. How does my business affect the world? A sustainable approach is an inclusive way and a mindful approach looks at what's going on in the world. Does that answer your question? Yes, and thank you, because I know these questions can be difficult to answer in such a short amount of time. And we appreciate your effort and think you've done a great job, and perhaps we can expand further upon them in future ITC programs.